larger font, please. Uh, and this is the EndoSync. It's September 6th. Uh, we have a demo from Leo. ZB, can you give us the intro again for a moment? Oh, yeah. So uh, we're going to explore how we successfully used um, what, uh, what has been recently enabled uh, under the name of vetted shims, uh, which is splitting lockdown into repair and harden steps uh, to uh, allow some level of uh, support for React Native. Uh, which means we can now run lockdown under React Native uh, without everything breaking. Uh, and we still cannot run things in compartments, but that's uh, for later. Uh, for now, we seem to be able to lock down the environment successfully uh, at the right moment in time. And uh, let's let's take a look at it. Sure. Thanks for the intro, ZB. So um, two main files to look at. Uh, so on the left, we have the entry file for React Native. So we've got quite a few things going on here. Um, initially, we looked at running Lockdown and then also Lockdown with vetted shims at the entry file. But um, it, we ran it, 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 it was quite problematic and it was a bit invasive into React Native where we had to start messing around with Babel plugins and other things. So um, yep, we've got some shims that we set up for React Native, uh, nothing too exciting there. And then we have various polyfills. And the main thing to note then is, um, this is where we register React Native. So what does the solution look like now with vetted shims? So uh, please zoom in uh, for the font to get larger uh, so it's readable over screen share. Sure. Yeah, if you can do one more, it would be helpful. Yeah, sure. Okay. So on the right, um, we have this file called initialize core, which does quite a few things with React Native. Um, I initially started diving into various ones of these because I thought initially they had to be vetted shims, but fortunately we only need reflect metadata as the vetted shim. So this turned out to be the most simple solution. So at the moment we're requiring the soon to be CES version, I think 0.18.8, .8, which is gonna have vetted shims. So this was taken from the pull request before. And here we're just running repair intrinsics. Now it turns out we need three of these options. They're required for everything to work successfully. And then one is optional at the moment. So I can demo those in a second. Um, yep, so we just got repair one vetted shim and then harden and then React Native is doing a few other things here. Um, and then finally it registers the app and then everything at our entry file gets called. So yeah, the demo, it's if I find the simulator, uh, there it is. So yeah, proof that this is running it. If I hit save, it should hot reload. And there we have it. And without the vetted shim, we had the previous error, which we've been looking at, which was to, to do with this um, package reflect metadata. So we can see that the vetted shim deals with this nicely for us. And running it without lockdown, we would just expect a normal app, which we have. So yeah, that's with and without lockdown baked into React Native. And just to detail the journey briefly um, in the last couple of commits. So initially looked at um, having the logic inside the entry file, if I can just find, read this down, find the tab. Yep, so initial attempt was having CES in the entry file of React Native and then also the repair intrinsics and Harden, but um, it turned out to be a bit problematic and required two patches. And with the vetted shim solution, when we remove these from the entry file and bake these into React Native, so we can see the code here much cleaner than the patch, but this is what the patch looks like for now. Um, yeah, baking it into React Native with vetted shims just made everything less intrusive and the most simple solution in the end. So, um, yep. And the last commit to just look at the journey. Um, yeah, okay, it's a bit hard to see patches, but before um, this is locked down, baked into React Native Core, and then this is the transition uh, vetted shims.
baked into React Native Core. So yeah, it's a bit hard to see the code difference there, but yeah. So if I'm if I'm reading this correctly, sure. Not much. Not much executes. Uh, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but is anything executing before Cess is initialized? So before Cess at this point. Um, so this is the first in this file. We, mm -hmm. I guess we could throw an error and look at the stack trace and then, um, yeah, we could double well, check. This seems, this seems right. Um, so you're, you're initializing sets, you're repairing intrinsics in, uh, immediately. And then, yeah. and then the only vetted shim is, is reflect metadata and everything in the left pane. Um, yeah. When is that executing and in what realm? Is that the same realm, and is it executing at the as because of the 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 last uh, the last call on the right? Yep. So the last call on the right is the React Native app registry. So then that is triggered by um, yeah, it's the last call in the entry file here, requiring the app registry. Yep. So I guess yeah, uh, our shims and our other polyfills, they're done here, and then it gets run there. But yeah, Cess is run before all of these. That's that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah, so I guess my question is along the line. Well, first, I think React Native only has a single realm. I don't think it has multiple realms. Um, but yeah, my question is similar to Chris, like trying to understand. I, I remember last time I looked at the internals of React Native was like maybe 2016. So uh, I'm sure things have changed since then. Um, I I don't remember the initialization of the the basically all the different steps. But you're saying initialize score is probably it's pretty early on in uh, the internal React Native. Like first, the React Native model from what I get is a bunch of code from internal to React Native runs, and then it ends up uh, running the index.js of your application, uh, which is why you have to patch uh, the React Native internals uh, to be able to run er uh, early enough. That's right, yeah. Um, so I did get a half working solution when I was running Lockdown purely at the entry file without touching the React Native internals, but that required model, um, patching modifying the Babel setup that we had. And that also required disabling the promise polyfill. So yeah, the, be the best solution is with Cess baked into React Native core here, but did we I we did look at um, trying to get it to work at the entry file to be the least intrusive, but. No, it, it makes all sense to have Cess baked in uh, React Native. Uh, and, and, I, and I suppose this is as early as, uh, as you can get, right? Yep. Yeah, as far, as far as I could find uh, it, yeah. The big difference uh, is the what we see in the left pane is uh, becoming bundled with the rest of the application and then running from the result of uh, the uh, React Native's uh, blessed bundler. Yeah. Uh, and what we see on the right uh, is running outside of that bundle and also before that bundle. I remember the React Native bundler. It's a joy. <laughs> Metro for the win. Yep. Um, cool. Uh, it's hard to imagine a better outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Can we look at these options? Uh, and I'm I'm actually curious why uh, you sure. had some of those are needed. Yeah. Sure. So um. Yeah. I can live disable and um see what we get. So if we just look, so if we clear the console, um, if, so if we look at console taming, if we disable that, um, so this is what we get. Um, oh yes, I think I made a comment there, which is um, console taming unsafe. Um, yeah, we get an unhandled JavaScript exception. So it's unhandled because we're running this before the error handling gets set up. Um, right. I'm, but, I'm wondering what they're overriding uh, that like they're uh, probably trying to write something on console. There's a, a there's a totally separate console implementation uh, that grabs whatever is logged to the console and forwards it uh, across layers so that it surfaces right. uh, outside of the Android app. 
so, so logbox is taking console and overriding uh log warn error etc i think this relates to um i don't know if we have an issue filed about this but one thing i've been wanting is um for repair uh intrinsics or basically lockdown but repair intrinsics really to leave uh some error powers on the initial compartment so that anybody so, so that anyone with a uh logging framework would be able to uh reveal the details of errors uh as needed um so currently we just expect people to use console log and so console log is replaced to be a little magic so it unwraps uh errors and then and, and pre-prints them um and gives you the cause and so on um Anybody that has a logging library should be able to do the same with their uh, logging library. And in this case, we should be able to create a uh, React Native logger that is able to unwrap censored errors uh, that way. Yes. The interesting thing is, if I remember correctly, we could also test it right now. But if we had a repair first and harden intrinsics after the lockbox being installed, it would still cause an error. That is yes because repair intrinsics is the part that is taming the console uh, yeah, can... but the the error was about uh being unable to um modify it uh yeah it it's possible that it's possible that the way uh the console is repaired is uh a little too aggressive <laughs> uh it might, so it might be creating a console i think console that, is getting hardened uh yeah. as part of repair exactly it might be creating a console that is uh already has non uh uh yeah it manually hardened i should it, it, if it's hard it, it can't have been hardened but it could have yep. been created Post. manually hardened yeah yeah it might have been those, those properties might have been defined uh non-configurable uh in which case that is likely a, a bug we shouldn't have yeah like, i agree i agree that the console the console should be mutable until hardened intrinsics so mm -hmm. the shims have an opportunity to fiddle with it yeah so that's uh that's the less interesting part the more interesting part is with uh, uh error trapping and uh unhandled uh, rejection trapping Right. Yeah. So what is error trapping again? Error trapping is the I added recently to unwrap unhandled rejections. And um it it attempts to detect the environment and it, it does so incorrectly on it, it does not recognize it recognizes React Native as a node platform and then uses the uses the the full expressiveness of the node API in order to trap unhandled rejections. Mm -hmm. And uh, it that is not available, so it fails. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, React Native defines global dot process, uh, but only for the purpose of holding on to process dot env because front end tooling uh, adopted it as the means of telling in which mode it's working, and now everything depends on process dot env, and it's a default way to. Uh, plug into most environments uh, unless you're running directly in the browser. Pretty much every other environment is going to have some resemblance of process.env. Uh, and this is weird uh, because we're getting global.process that doesn't have anything useful on it. Uh, so the feature detection is going to have to be uh, a bit more careful around it, this part. It's a pretty normal shim, uh, to be honest, to have a uh, process and, and like that. Uh, yes, yeah, and and CES depends on it as well. If you want to thread in lockdown options through the, your environment, that is one of the that is that is the way CES detects them, and it can be arranged to detect them in other in 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 a compartment, for example. If you endow a compartment with process.env, that's just expected to be the the mechanism for communicating options for CES as well. So yeah, this is just a bug in CES that like as, as discussed previously, ZB, 
we need to make the, the feature detection more specific. Okay, and what's the last bit we needed to switch? Oh, so the last one is, oh yeah, so this is this option is required as well. Um, otherwise- Yeah, that's, get... that's the same thing. Uh, let's, let's talk about override taming. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be demoable now because override taming was a problem earlier. You need to use, you need to do the other trapping again. Okay, let's take a look. Console taming. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's add that back. Okay, so we got all four of them. Okay, so let's just make sure it's working as it should be. Yep. Yeah, okay, so if we disable override taming. So at the moment, it's fine without yeah, it. We're, we're not going to get an error now. Uh, but uh, override taming set to severe was useful in some cases where uh, we were getting um, I think it was something to do with using a polyfill uh, that was at the same time uh, a module namespace. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> So there was a case where uh, Babel uh, would uh, have a module and that module exported uh, a, a function uh, that was then used by something else to uh, replace uh, object uh, dot get own property. I think that was the, the shim. One of those, uh, definitely. Uh, and the problem was uh, when you invoked it, uh, it would go into the module and for reasons that I didn't fully understand, uh, try to redefine itself and re-export itself uh, or, or replace the export. Anyway, uh, it would end up uh, attempting to write to the dot .default uh, field uh, on something uh, that had a frozen prototype. Uh, I'm Perfect. probably mixing two different situations now, but uh, the idea was that uh, setting taming to severe. Uh, I think it was this one. Um, yeah, but I'm I'm also possibly yeah it was get prototype off, but I'm also possibly mixing it with something else. Uh, anyway, um, setting uh, override taming to severe. Uh, is generally helpful. And the question to the group here is, um, are there any good reasons not to use it? Is there a performance uh, penalty that we have to pay for it? Maybe stack traces are weird. I don't know. Hmm. Or debugger. Debuggers get very weird. Uh, that's for sure, because debuggers show um, accessors differently than uh, than data properties. So your debugger view would be cluttered. Um, I don't think there is any safety mm -hmm. with using severe. Yeah, it would be called unsafe if there was a safety yeah. uh, issue around it. Them. But I wonder if it affects performance in any way. But right. If it does, it probably affects it in a good way. I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, and I mean, you're you're in, you're going to be invoking invoking uh, accessors every time you try to set those things or get them. So there is a technically you're doing more work, and you're uh, you, you you're not letting the engine. Just do its optimization on on uh, data property access. Um, how is it working then? If I uh, attempt to write to my own property that happens to have the same name as something on the prototype chain, uh, that uh, override taming functionality is creating getters and setters uh, on that no. prototype deeper uh, in the chain uh, okay. to. You're right. The set will just create a data property on the target. Uh, so every access after that will just be um, as efficient as before. Yeah, maybe maybe it's fine. 
Oh, so the target property of set is not uh, the reference to the prototype on which we were creating the setter, but uh, the target of the assignment. Mm -hmm. Correct. The target and the receiver are two different things for accessors. Uh -huh. OK. Got it. Um, right. So in this case, the accessor would be invoked as with this as the um so the receiver of the accessor sorry the this context of the accessor when executed would be the targets uh um, if you did if you compare it to like the reflect no you getting confused myself right now so reflect dot set as targets um Target property and then receiver, uh, and then the value, or maybe it's a fourth one anyway. Um, the target is the actual object. The uh, receiver is the prototype object that uh, we climbed up to where we found the uh, where we found the uh, accessor. Yes, receiver is last. Yeah. Um, and so the accessor ends up being invoked with the target as it's uh, as it's this. So it can install the new. In in our, in our case, it will install the data property on the target. So any get after that will no longer climb up the prototype chain. It's basically the behavior that would happen if there was no yep. override. Like, <laughs> Yeah. So, so it's so it's perfectly override. fine to uh, set that up for every uh, property that exists on available prototypes, pretty much. Uh, the I only would... cost would be some additional memory for storing all of the function instances for setters. Yes. It, uh... yeah. yeah, it's it's called severe um, because of its because it alters the relationship between Hardened the the emulated hardened JavaScript and what we hope for hardened JavaScript, it's it's and and it's detectable, right? So if you if you're running that all the time, you're more likely to write code that is sensitive to a difference between the environment you're running in and the idealization of that environment. So it, which is to say, it's probably fine. There is a. There is a slightly greater chance that if one day you're able to migrate to a native implementation of hardened JavaScript, that your code would detect the difference and be sensitive to it. But that's that's the kind of risk. OK, I might want to explore that further uh, asynchronously. Uh, but we were also looking into enabling that for snaps because some people were uh, getting in trouble because of the override mistake while writing snaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In general, uh, if you're running into the override mistake with the SES shim, you'll probably run into the override mistake on a true emulation, a, a, a native implementation of hardened JavaScript, and we need to find a way to... And we need to fix the override mistake. Yeah, uh, and also need to fix, in the meantime, packages that uh, rely on assignments. Yeah, exactly. So not having override taming enabled provides an incentive to herd the JavaScript ecosystem toward a state where it is better prepared to experience the override mistake. Yeah, the problem is people uh, more often uh, generate the code that's problematic themselves than find it in packages. Uh, so the most common case is when they define a two string on something and then it hurts. Yes, yeah, two string and constructor. If you define them, if you define those methods on a class, that's not an override problem. Those are classes are have the semantics of defined property. Um, but yes, if you're doing an old style, um, if you're doing an old style two string assignment, then then you're then you're going to run into that. 
we find that at Agoric, we don't do that. <laughs> we either use we either use concise methods. Uh, well, we generally use concise methods or the analogs for it, which are defined property based, and not um, and don't rely on assignment semantics for creating methods. But uh, I, yeah, in our experience, we run into this problem most mostly with shims targeting earlier, like pre class class versions of javascript which is to say that there is some hope that the problem will eventually just go away yeah well the community is often using typescript and they don't have a lot of say about what ends up being used for setting fields mm -hmm. so that's also a thing yeah and we, we but, i mean that, that's the thing if we find uh compilers that generate code that trigger the override mistake, we need to, fi to fix those compilers. Yeah, and an issue has been filed against TypeScript itself because it used an extension mechanism that was doing assignment instead of defined property. I do not recall whether they shipped that fix. Sounds good though. Yeah, we need to report those. Okay, yeah. I think I have all the input I needed to uh, go back to snaps with this. Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh yeah, I guess. Could I ask a question? When when do we think the next release might be? With um... <laughs> I think that this has already been released, Leo. Um, oh okay, sure. I was looking at the tags. I think the other day. Yeah, sure. Cool. Cool. Um, we haven't integrated with Agoric SDK yet, which is why I feel like it hasn't shipped. <laughs> but, but there an npm package has been generated with vetted shims. Cool, awesome. I'll replace it. Okay. Cool. Uh, do we have anything else on the agenda? No, Before I think we that's go good. into the plugin. Let's go into the plugin. Okay. So this is going to be a short demo. Um, whoa, whoa, but this might also be of, a great time for uh, um, an appearance from Matthew's cat. <laughs> go, go ahead, Steve. I was actually okay. not sure what Matthew was up to <laughs> until you said it. <laughs> my cat trying to get on my keyboard. Okay. That's one well, well, you're okay. It's just your cat. And okay. Like a, yeah. Just anything else. Put a put a blinking cursor in chat and make sure you hit the return every now and then, and we're gonna be fine. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna share the entire screen. Hopefully, not sharing too much. Uh, luckily, this is a recording, not streaming. Anyway. Uh, so I have an app. Uh, that's pretending to do things. Uh, this app uses the uh, import syntax, but it also uh, loads an MJS file uh, that explicitly uses import syntax. It also loads uh, a module that's CommonJS. It loads some TypeScript. Uh, this is uh, the, the typical mess you can expect uh, when you're building frontends. Uh, there's uh, also a second app uh, to prove that we can have multiple entry points. Uh, and this whole thing is being built with Webpack. Uh, and that can be complicated. So uh, uh, do I want to go through all of it? I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, I've made this example now. Um, use multiple Webpack features uh, and things that are often used. Uh, I don't know why everything is now underlined, so don't blame me. I... Zibi, could you please zoom in considerably? Oh, sure. Thank yeah. you. Some more zoom. Much zoom. More, 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 more. More zoom. Okay. Doing more zoom. Uh, I don't think I can fit more zoom on the screen, but this might be enough. Okay. So, uh, Good old Webpack stuff, uh, setting up uh, how things are going to get uh, compiled, et cetera. And now the, the interesting part is we have plugins. And we have some 
commonly used plugins here uh, just to prove we do not uh, interfere with them, which we did a lot, uh, but after significant work, uh, we no longer do. Uh, and this is the score truck plugin, which is the, um, the code name for Lava Mode's webhook plugin. Uh, we'll see if it sticks. Uh, and it's accepting lockdown setup. Um, so we can um, configure what uh, goes into lockdown. It accepts policy uh, and some configuration uh, for itself, uh, which uh, then in turn causes uh, Webpack to use our plugin to build things. Uh, and our plugin also attaches some runtime. What it ends up doing is creating things that look like this. So we have, why does it keep on turning everything red? Yeah, um, I changed some configurations in this VS Code recently, sorry for that. <laughs> anyway, uh, we have a module and that module gets wrapped in uh, with statements. Uh, this is coming from our function that we put on uh, Webpack's namespace for shipping runtime stuff. Uh, and that function gets called. This time it's, it gets called with the root of the application. So it's the least interesting case, but we should have some more interesting cases somewhere here. Yeah, so here we are identifying a specific package uh, and getting everything prepared for the package. So if this function malfunctions for any reasons, uh, including detecting that lockdown was never called, uh, it's going to return an empty object, which will turn the module into a no-op function. This is uh, kind of an important fallback. Uh, and other than this, uh, we are doing triple backflip instead of quadruple backflip, uh, where first we're getting the globals, then we're getting uh, runtime handlers, which is the part that overrides Webpack's uh, require uh, functionality uh, with all of the weird things that stick out of it. Um, and then the last bit is a scope terminator, which is even slightly stricter uh, than the original scope terminator from SAS because it's a proxy that uh, returns true for every has request uh, instead of uh, trying to be more sophisticated about it because we're not uh, protecting only the global scope. We're also protecting the local scope where a bunch of uh, things from Webpack could be uh, available. Okay, now switching to the browser to show you what it does. Uh, let's refresh. Okay, uh, so what it does is it turns the page green uh, to prove that extracting CSS from the bundle actually works. So this part works. Uh, the CSS extract plugin was not uh, broken by our wrapping. Uh, and uh, you can probably tell from uh, the emphasis that I put on it that it wasn't an easy uh, thing to do. Uh, and then the app itself is printing out a few things, but generally working. Also, a proof that uh, lockdown was called uh, is visible. Uh, now, this thing is applying our policy. And this is the policy here. Uh, what I want to do is to change it from true to false uh, so that the package Ethereum cryptography is not going to be able to uh, load this package from noble hashes. Uh, and I've saved the changed policy. I now need to rebuild uh, the bundle. So we are successfully getting a new bundle uh, and the policy is uh, threaded into the bundle. So now if I refresh the page, I'm going to get an error that uh, you don't see because it's too small. Um, the error is policy does not allow importing uh, noble slash secp 256k1 from Ethereum cryptography. And that's how we enforce things. Uh, so that part works. 
Uh, I had a nicer demo with a malicious package called Cookie Monster trying to steal cookies. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the current version of uh, our runtime that we use here uh, is not yet a complete implementation of global endowments. Uh, it's lacking the rewrite. So fetch is being called on a this that is not the global this. Uh, and complaining about it. So there's one last bit to fix before this is uh, demoable uh, in practice and usable for initial testing. That's the demo. And then we can hopefully talk consequences and risks uh, because that's what I'm here for. <laughs> so please poke holes in our idea. I think I need to look more closely at your uh, stack of backflips. Uh, yeah, that will be made available. Uh, well, it, it is public uh, on the branch. I, I actually uh, admit that part I was not looking at screen. Can you show that again? Oh, yeah, no problem. So I'm going to share this and show the backflips in the file. So this is the file that's being generated, and I just want to turn off uh, whatever's making these colors. Uh, <laughs> it's not bothering me for what it's worth. Okay. Uh, okay. So what we're having here so is the, the three backflips. Uh, the first one contains a reference to the intended uh, globals. This is the, these are, these, this is the globals object that contains the endowments, right? Yeah. And that's arranged by other means by a, uh, um, on, on line 230, you're calling. Yeah. On line 230, we're calling a function, uh, that's part of our runtime, which gets, uh, the reference that we can use to look up the policy, uh, and get some references that are Webpack specific to thread them in. Uh, it looks up the policy and attenuates the global object and uh, returns it as capital G on uh, the object that it produces that gets passed to a call on this closure. Uh, so, so that's level H one. RH contains the Webpack, Webpack require. Uh, um, this one contains Webpack require. Or, it's, or, or rather, it's a it's an object that contains a require function. Is this something that is this? There is no require function anymore. Uh, Webpack is uh, getting rid of it and replacing all usage of require function with Webpack require. So this is only containing the intended endowments uh, defined by the policy. Mm -hmm. uh, runtime handler uh, is a I think it's still an object, not a proxy, uh, that contains a new implementation of Webpack require, uh, where we are wrapping the actual Webpack require in some policy uh, lookups for uh, enforcing which package can load which other package. And, and, um, I, and I assume it doesn't have a lever mode uh, extension on it. Yes, yes. This one is uh, no longer available when you access Webpack require from within uh, the function being evaluated inside of the with statements. So what is being rebuilt is Webpack require itself is a function. So for the most basic uh, use case where you just require a module, uh, that function is being called. And then it's also used, uh, because it's JavaScript, uh, it's also used as a namespace for other things that Webpack is using. Uh, but these things are not very powerful. They tend to be useful for uh, turning a, a ESM style uh, result of compilation into something that can be uh, properly threaded including uh, the live bindings so uh, which this, we all this love is, this is the equivalent of the global lexicals basically the rh is the equivalent of a uh, of what we're using as global lexicals i don't remember do we put mm -hmm. those lexicals 
outside of the global or I thought it was inside the global and any reason why it is outside right now instead of inside? Um, well, these two globals and uh, runtime handler are in this order because it's uh, not really convenient to uh, make them happen at the same time. But the order is uh, not important in my opinion. So mm, the list of globals is uh, controlled by uh, the person setting the policy. So they're not very likely to intend to put Webpack require in there. Yeah, um, I guess my question is what happens if somebody ends up putting uh, Webpack require on, the glo on their global objects? Uh, that will make Webpack require undefined because it's not a global. It only exists in the local scope of this function. So we will not be able to fetch it from uh, the reference that we use to populate globals. No, I mean, if the code, if the module that ends up in there ends up putting a Webpack require first, I guess, does Webpack rewrite Webpack require if it finds it? What happens? Uh, I didn't explicitly try it, but yes, it does. It doesn't mean that you couldn't reach it at runtime. You can reach it at runtime if your code is uh, referencing it uh, from a variable. Like you can yeah. uh, prompt the user for input and use it as a key uh, and then try to look it up on your global this or yeah. whatever. I'm just wondering like, yeah, what happens basically if someone sets uh, Webpack require on their global, um, so they do global this, uh, you know, square bracket Webpack mm -hmm. require equals whatever, then anything later that might invoke this uh, from the transform? No, it's, uh, it's not going to happen because uh, uh, this thing is within the with statement uh, uh, with with this thing as its global uh, object. And this is a global this coming from a SES compartment uh, with endowments. So well, anything so that you know from... Global this should be equal to this.g, right? Yes. And it's a separate instance for each of yes. these packages. Cool. So you can only mess with you're only messing with your own uh, module, I understand, yeah. but you're messing with your own module. Uh, and um, yeah, just wondering if if that's something we should care about or not. I know, I understand you're only messing with your own module. Yeah. yeah. So the problem. compartment is shared by every um, Thing package. Wait, let me. Yeah. So, so you, so you could break, so you could write a program that has spooky action at a distance where one module's assignment to global this can interfere with the dependencies that are available in another from another module in the same compartment. Yes, um, in the same package. A package can uh, have one module that breaks uh, every module that gets evaluated after it in that package. Yeah, the, uh, let's chalk this up to a potential loss of fidelity, but, to, but which could be avoided by. Uh, could it be avoided? It would be avoided by switching the order. Uh, yes. Uh, would switching the order then uh, affect what's available as uh, a this reference on? on a function that we don't bind. Yeah, you would you would get yes. No. Well if if you were to bind the name, if you were to if, if you were to lexically obtain webpack require, um hmm. And so what I remember is uh, going from a single with statement with a big proxy to quadruple backflip gave us uh, 
the it, benefit it, of disabling this one partial yes uh, it, like it, a, it, a quarter of an exploit it, that was what, able to grab the reference to the proxy and what, here, what, it gives, what it gives you is that a um a function on uh on rh a basically a lexical like that would be able to discover uh its lexical context uh, object that rh object but mm -hmm. as long as it those are privileged ones most likely uh, that you control the implementation yes. of as long as you don't leak that object anywhere it doesn't go anywhere okay so the order doesn't doesn't change that there are any any functions on rh uh, will still get the rh objects as their um uh as their this context they just need to be careful not to leak it back out yeah okay that sounds good and st is the um, it's the scope terminator and i can show you the implementation of the scope terminator because it's tiny uh yeah you, you mentioned it, uh, it's a proxy that re returns true to any has uh which which we've considered doing again it's a loss of fidelity for um referencers but that that's about it mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay. this is the entirety of the scope terminator that mm -hmm. we're using there yeah. So, what was the problem with uh, looking at what was on the actual global uh, dynamic? Uh, that's because uh, in a Webpack bundle, uh, the global is not the only scope above us. We also have other scopes above us. Ah, right. So you may need, and you don't automatically know. I want the scope yeah. terminator to uh, be uh, impossible to get through to reach a higher scope to reach one of those, for example. Yeah, I mean, if you're fine with the loss of fidelity uh, for uh, reference errors, fine. Um, significantly more fidelity is lost in the process of bundling. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So another another question would be um, the webpack require that is injected into the runtime handler. Um, is there how, what what measures have you taken to ensure that it cannot leak a communication channel or um, a, a communication channel between compartments? Is it is it hardened? Um, yeah, this part is interesting. Uh, it's probably not fully ready yet. So what I'm doing, uh, let me decide where to start. Uh, so here at runtime, uh, I'm creating a uh, wrapped version of Webpack require. Probably most of this is unnecessarily done multiple times, but uh, never mind. Uh, so I'm putting a bunch of uh, one letter named items uh, back on uh, the webpack require from the original one while hardening them just in case. Uh, and then I'm making sure that uh, the reference to all modules is not there uh, and available to anyone because you can do webpack require dot m and that's a map of all other modules that you could potentially fiddle with at runtime uh, with no limits so i'm getting rid of that replacing it with a warning uh, and this is where i'm returning policy require as webpack require uh, onto the overrides that i'm producing uh, and finally, they get put on top of the runtime handler uh, to replace Webpack require. And I'm not yet hardening the Webpack require reference itself. And there's one per compartment? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If there's one per compartment, I don't think it's vulnerable. But you again, it's another foot gun mm -hmm. okay yeah, so there's there's room for uh hardening this bit a little more i've made some notes here also about what uh different things webpack require is returning uh also if i 
uh, if I harden it, uh, I have to be careful not to transitively harden the modules collection because that would uh, disable uh, being able to load things from chunks. Webpack is splitting the app into chunks and the functionality of loading those chunks and putting them together uh, under one runtime uh, has JSON P uh, in its name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah okay. and that's for a reason so it's using a very naive mechanism of having a global function that every chunk uh, can call uh, to register its bits as uh, elements on the map mm -hmm. uh, okay and it's then webpack require is using that map it's for dynamic uh, import right uh, it's for chunking so if you have uh, if you have multiple chunks in the app, uh, there's only going to be one runtime. And here I have runtime in a separate chunk. Uh, it's been generated that way. And then somewhere near the end, if I remember correctly, yeah, there's this beautiful bit. Uh, Webpack chunk up. Uh, and that function is being called by... this to put all of the elements here uh, into this collection of modules that Webpack can invoke. Uh, and that's how it, the, the whole thing is assembled from multiple files. So index.html uh, contains uh, app.js, app2.js, and also runtime. Uh, don't ask me why they are in this order. Somehow it works still. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, um, Matthew, you wanted to take a look at the scope terminator again. Yep. Uh, just a second. I left it here. Okay, so not much to look at. There it is. I might have assumed Harden is unavailable while writing this, probably unnecessarily, because Harden should be there. Um, yep, it's fine. Uh, freezing new proxy is not going to really get you much, because you're just going to invoke the trap that doesn't exist on, uh, on the proxy. Um, oh, yeah, that's true. I I've already frozen the target. Yeah. The targets, that, that's what I want to see what you were using as targets. You're basically using uh, an empty object that really doesn't have anything. That that was the main thing. Um, if anything, if you really wanted to be defensive, you could like have a get trap that, um, that returns undefined. Um, I believe that's what you want at the very least. Uh, or actually, no, throw is an error. That's what you want. You want an error to happen. I don't remember. Anyway. Uh, um, would a get trap be called if has, uh, oh, so, well, sorry, if there's nothing on, but wait, uh, again, what's actually, the difference between get trap and having a totally empty object in terms of uh, what I'm giving away? Um, I mean, that means basically you're, yeah, you're, Gonna uh, have the engine go on the targets, do a reflect get of the target, and yeah. um, and get nothing out of it. It's just oh, so uh, this throwing an error is about uh, throwing an error that emulates uh, a, a name not existing in the scope instead of returning undefined. Is that it? Maybe that's what I'm, I, no, I mean the returning undefined or throwing an error is like more of being explicit about. Uh, what happens instead of like it took me a minute. I was like, wait, what was the target again here? And making sure that you can you really can't get access to anything. Uh, because for example, if you had used a uh an empty object like as you know, empty object notation, it would have gone onto the object prototype to which you could have mm -hmm. gone out. Uh yeah. if somehow something was on the object prototype, but really shouldn't be, but yeah. 
Actually, which prototypes already available. It doesn't. It doesn't really change much. It's just the you have to think more about like where it's what it's looking up after that, which is the target. Okay, noted. Um, but yeah, no, that definitely that definitely works. <clears throat> there is no security issues there. Is it? Uh, would it because it's saying has true? It's going to follow up with a get. So you could emulate a reference error for everything that gets here, right? Um, if you throw yes. Yeah, I could. It's a header that throws. That might be a better developer experience, but definitely not a um, a security issue. I think there's a question about like what is uh yeah, there are there you will fail to emulate something one one thing or the other. This is it, there's no way around it. Um, like type def or type of is going to have one behavior, and um, yeah, I I forget what the trade off is, but there there's definitely it is definitely not possible to faithfully emulate everything perfectly here. Yeah, I I don't mind looking at what uh, consequences bundling has. I don't really think we need to be very faithful uh, about the environment. So the, the Since other- Since this is on the record, let me say, people use Jest. Does that dismiss any worries about the environment being faithful? Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, when can we add an environment in Jest uh, that uses Cess instead of uh, Realms? Um, I, it, it, it's a pluggable environment system, so we really should be able to do that. But anyway. I yeah. there's, there's another thing that CES does here that is meant to be a defense against the evolution of the language. If the, if the meta object protocol of the language introduces a new trap, we wanted uh, we we put a, a mechanism in place in CES so that if the language evolves to include a new trap on proxies, that those traps will by default fail. Um, and uh, that might be something worth exploring here. Okay, um, if you could point me to the implementation because I don't recall seeing it. Yeah, the the trick is that the the handler object is itself a proxy that if you attempt to access something that is not on the true oh, okay. yeah. exception, <laughs> and that may mean that you have to implement more methods on the true handler. Um, um, yeah, sure. at this point, I would rather not because this is part of the runtime. So I'm trying to keep it short. And yeah. this is a, yeah, so, this so is a concern have... that's, uh, uh, well, I'm going to have more concerns around making sure that the, the bundle itself is secure with all the Webpack functionality uh, and all of the plugins that could potentially undermine our own functionality. Uh, that's, uh, I don't think I want to go that far with anticipating potential future problems. But uh, yeah, we'll see how much the runtime grows. At this time, I think runtime is uh, about 500 lines. So not great, but not bad. Yeah, and what, yeah. So, so I think that this is, like if an attack becomes possible because of evolution to the meta object protocol or the API of proxy handler, it would need to be, it would need to be something of the form where your program was able to cause, but it's hard to anticipate what that would be. Um, but since the object itself is because of the layering of your, um, of your with blocks, I think it is unlikely that yeah. the runtime handler would leak or, yeah, for, you, or there this is one. no way for untrusted code to get a reference to the scope terminator. Right. Because yeah. there's not a function on scope terminator yeah, that could on return it. it. Yes. Okay. All right. So I think that, yeah, the, the threat is very limited. 
but let's not forget about it. Um, yeah. All right. And I think that are, are we over time? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. So this has been a this has been a great presentation. Thank you. Um, I'll be sure to distribute the recording. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Let me let me know if anything needs to be redacted before I publish. All right. Thank you.